Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into the show this morning. I have a very special guest on the show. His name is Jamie, and uh, he works on a uh, comic book that outlines some of the ideas of voluntarism, the idea of free market libertarianism without uh, rulers, without people who lord over us and target us with jail cells and and all of these kind of things. So, uh, Jamie, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Great. So maybe you can begin by telling us a little bit about your comic and some of the characters and the premise of the comic. Absolutely. So Voluntary is the comic series centers itself around a young man, and this young man's name is Jack Lloyd. And where the story kind of begins in the universe is that a certain black hole cosmic radiation event causes certain beings on Earth to become superpowered effectively. And this radiation that reels to Earth kind of sets off the beginnings of the story. And in addition to that kind of cosmic event going on, governments of the world are working together to try to institute a type of ultimate martial law. And especially some of the bigger superpowers are working toward that goal. And this black hole radiation event kind of messes up some of those plans because it changes the nature of what they were having to deal with in terms of um, potential super uh, powers and, and superheroes that might come and and foil their plan. And so this intersection kind of happens where people are given the power to resist what is the ultimate tyranny. And along those lines, you know, the main character develops, and there's issues that come up along with his family and with other people that he meets. And, you know, even one of the characters, Mac Lee, is a black ops defector who um, helps him out because of learning about the government's plans to try to institute this type of uh, martial law on a grander scale. And so it really kind of sets off from that premise of a, a mixture of, you know, supernatural events or, su- you could say, superhuman events, um, plus, you know, this type of dystopian future setting in. And it touches on a lot of real-world issues as far as the police state's concerned, as far as globalism is concerned, you know, as far as how far do things go before people start to resist. Yeah, that's that's exactly what the point that I was going to bring up, Jamie, is that it sounds when you're describing this almost exactly like what is happening in real life. And and that's uh, the funny thing about fiction is that it really kind of um, is a philosophy about what people see in their real world, uh, just transposed onto various characters throughout the fiction book. And um, I, I thought it was very interesting what you were talking about with people having trouble talking about these ideas and explaining this kind of stuff to other people in their lives. Uh, Has that been the case for you in your own personal life? Um, As far as voluntarism is concerned, I've overall had a pretty easy time talking to people about it when you talk about it from just the principles and the base concepts. I think people struggle the most when they try to apply those principles in their own lives because they've already made so many intellectual exceptions for what they see in their lives, you know, calling, um, taxation, you know, anything other than, than theft. You know, they, they've kind of turned what, what could be theft into a, di- a different type of term. It's a euphemism. Um, they, you know, they call murder war, they call murder, you know, the draft or national defense, and now um, people kind of make these intellectual exceptions for themselves. And so I think really where it gets hard for people is when they've kind of understood these basic principles and they try to apply it on their lives, they suddenly realize the hypocrisy. And I think people have been so ingrained to make these exceptions and to make, um, you know, these types of uh, holes in their critical thinking that it's, it's difficult once they try to apply it. And that's really where the conflict comes in. Yeah, I think additionally they, they know people who are involved within the system who rely on a paycheck that is getting uh, money from this system, either through a social security check or through, you know, employment from this organization. And so it's very hard to conceptualize what would occur without this organization, because you would imagine that those people would be out of work, that they would be homeless, that they wouldn't be able to afford uh, things for themselves. But economically, we know that when the market is opened up, that other opportunities pop up and people get jobs in other areas or maybe in the same area. Just it would all be done voluntarily rather than by force. Sure, absolutely. Those needs of people don't dissipate. You know, everybody has 
demands and wants and needs, and they don't magically appear or disappear based on the government. They always exist, and the question is, is how are those needs and wants fulfilled? Are they fulfilled because of people voluntarily consenting to transact, or are people being forced into a system with automatic mandatory rulers and not being allowed to make choices in their lives about what they truly want? And I think the system that has the most theft and murder behind it at its core is going to end up meeting fewer needs and wants and the ones that it does in a, in a, in a, a basically an inefficient way. Right, right. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, what has been the response to your comic? Uh, what is your target audience and how have they received the work that you've put out there? Sure. Um, overall, the comic has been widely, um, I guess you could say, accepted as far as, you know, liberty folks are concerned. I think a lot of people are excited to see um, libertarianism have a, a kind of a main stage front with the comic field because there hasn't really been something where, uh, you know, liberty is at the forefront of the comic. You know, there's been a lot of comics that talk about liberty a little bit or they have those principles in the background, but nothing really puts them in the forefront and makes that a part of the discourse of the presentation and of the narrative. Um, this is really the kind of the first comic universe that does that for the universe itself. And so there's been a lot of welcoming to that, which is nice. Um, there are some, of course, who are not really into the fantasy things. They're more into philosophy, and maybe they're more academically inclined with just sticking to those things, and they're a bit drier, so they don't care. But overall, I would say that most people are excited to see something um, come up that actually is entertaining, but also has something of uh, you know weighty intellectual meat to it. Yeah, I think fiction is a wonderful way of getting ideas out to people. Uh, fantasy and sci-fi, these are all means of building these entirely different societal structures that exist outside of reality, but that still embody the philosophical ideas that we want to get across to people. And so uh, there's been a number of wonderful sci-fi writers that have put forward very libertarian concepts, uh, such as Robert Heinlein and the weapon shops of Ivan's Guard. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other uh, really great fantasy and sci-fi that is out there that embodies libertarianism. So with your approach to fictional writing, did you use more of a humorous approach, or is it more of an action-oriented? Like, what, what would you uh, put your comic book in the genre of? Sure. I, I would say this is very traditional superhero uh, genre in terms of how it flows. I would, you know, hope to see it within the, the realms of what you'd see for, like, Marvel or DC or Dark Horse or, you know, IDW or something like that. It's supposed to be within that kind of... Um, realm where there's a diversity of characters and possible side stories and so on and so forth, but it all deals with this one kind of universe, and there's a lot of, um, I guess you could say, diversity within that universe. So the main front line, of course, you know, you have the action and the heroic spirit part of that, um, but there's also opportunity for other types of side stories and background characters in each person. Um, or creature within the series, um, you know, has their own personality and things that, you know, go on with them and, and, and their own types of uh, potential side adventures that can happen. So what kind of challenges did you come across when you were creating this book? Uh, I see a challenge with superheroes as making them a little bit too powerful because you can do anything with them and they have these superhuman feats and things like that. Uh, there tends to be the possibility that they could be so powerful that they don't have a weakness or they're not really you know, able to be uh, hurt. That's why you usually have the contrast of the supervillain which can uh, fight on par with the superhero. And uh, so what, what kind of things did you come across in the book like this, and, and how did you balance that out? Sure, yeah, and in the, in the development aspect of it, um, there's always growth. And the growth comes from kind of the base concept of, of how the powers arise, and that is that the black hole radiation causes the, those who do survive the initial impact to uh, mutate in a way where their bodies become stronger and more readily able to heal over time. And so there is um, a time factor and an age factor that comes into play, you know, where strength increases over time um, and endurance and stamina and so on and so forth. And there's also certain creatures who are more powerful or certain characters who are more powerful. So there's definitely a, a balance. It's certainly not, you know, a there's a master 
uh, powerful singular entity, and they can you know right off the bat you know destroy multi universes kind of thing. There's a, a an element of development um, that comes along the way that makes it exciting and that you know continues the mystery of the series. Yeah, and I've played a lot of uh, role playing games. That's one of my favorite genre of games, and it, it's that development that really uh, holds my interest. It, it, you start off as this character who's not very strong, he's a little naive, he doesn't really know what's going on in the world, and then as he accumulates life events and experience, EXP as it's called, uh, then he grows and he, he becomes this much more powerful character. And uh, I've always liked that aspect of uh, fiction and, and fantasy and, and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. I think that's also important, not just on the aspect of the physicality, but also the, the, the philosophy behind it. You know, being able to have an opportunity to discuss issues and to flesh out why, you know, something is proper or not, or what should be the appropriate response to a certain kind of attack. I think that comes with character development, and I think that um, the comic world gives a nice opportunity to think about uh, when is it appropriate to use a certain type of response or not underneath the principle of the NAP, the non-aggression principle, for those who haven't heard of that term before. Um, but, you know, even just with the little short status zombies issue, um, thinking about that, you know, how do you treat a status zombie? If, you know, of course, it's, it's a play on words, but if you're super powerful, do you kill an attacking zombie? You know, if you're powerful enough just to hold them back, do you hold them back? You know, those kinds of thoughts come up. How do you neutralize a threat? you know, that you're not certain about their full intentions or whether they can be fixed. I mean, those, those kinds of issues are definitely things I want to continue to develop and flesh out and help people think about all the gray areas within, you know, liberty and the, the philosophy of, of, um, of non-aggression. That, that's a very good point. And, um, you know, the characters on The Walking Dead, they uh, certainly struggle with this. There's there's some characters on the show that really don't feel very good about uh, killing the zombies, even though the zombies want to attack them, they want to eat their brains, they want to obviously violate their property rights. Um, there are people on the show who feel very strongly that they don't really want to actually kill the zombies. And, uh, right. you know, oftentimes when they're walking past and the zombies can't actually get them, they don't go over there and, and maliciously just destroy that life form, but they do recognize the um, violence and the danger that these zombies certainly pose. And uh, the analogy here is the state. Uh, people who use the state certainly uh, aggress against people's property and their person. Uh, they certainly violate people's property rights. They use uh, threats of coercion and force. And so how do we deal with that? Like, how do we, we, we obviously don't want to start shooting people or something like that, but how do we assert that we want to defend our person and property without, you know, actually hurting other people. Exactly. It's one of those great philosophical questions that we have even now with the state, as you mentioned. And, you know, it's one of those things. It could be just like you think about that TV show, Walking Dead, what do you do? And, you know, I think it is wise to say, I'm not going to escalate the violence. I'm going to push for liberty, and I'm only going to use that defensive force when they decide to attack, when they're about to actually attack. You know, if you don't have to um, enact more violence or create more violence and turmoil and uh, cause more blowback, then don't. And I think that's that's one of those questions that needs to be answered and fleshed out, and it can be fleshed out, you know, in fun ways in the comic universe, and that could lead to people thinking about, okay, well, how does that work in the real world? You know, and I think about um, when it comes to self-defense and the use of different types of non-lethal forces, you know, whether it's tasers or pepper spray or you know, what types of weapons do you use against people, you know, what is the appropriate response? How much is too much for different types of aggressions? And I think that needs to be thought out, and I think uh, comics are a fun way to start that discussion without having to be too serious and just, you know, talking about hard philosophy for most people who would rather think about it in a more entertaining way. Right, right. And uh, so um, I'm talking with Jamie. He is a uh, writer and developer of a comic book series called The Voluntarius. And we are talking a little bit about comics and fantasy and the state and what, how we can use fiction to kind of relate ideas to other people. So, Jamie, can you tell me a little bit about uh, maybe your history and your background? Like, how did you come upon these ideas and why do you feel so strongly about them? Sure. So uh, my history on, on these principles, you know, stem back to about uh, when I was 20 years old and I was in a history class at, in my uh, undergraduate institution. And we started talking about the American eugenics movement, and it wasn't something I'd really learned about before. I didn't really know that it began here in the United States and was actually exported over to Germany, leading to, you know, uh, Hitler's 
uh, time over there and, and, and really get do that on a large scale. Um, so learning about that made me question what else I didn't know about American history. And I started to do a lot of research, and I spent some time reading various authors and watching a lot of videos and just, you know, over the, you know, basically a couple of years, really just taking a look back and revisiting everything I learned. And it started to lead me to think about libertarianism. And before then, I was just kind of like a, I guess you could say paleoconservative, maybe neoconservative, just someone who, you know, was kind of technically supporting the state and understood that, you know, conservative economic policies were good, but I hadn't really fleshed out that all the way to the bottom. And by the end of my two-year journey, I started to realize, okay, if I need to be consistent with my principles, how far do I take this? And, you know, I started to read things by Life Inner Spooner and Rothbard and um, even things, you know, like on Mark Stevens and stuff like that, and just continued to, to process it. And about three years in, I was, uh, I was definitely choosing voluntarism as a consistent way to hold my values um, without having even finished all the outcomes, you know, based on that. But I just said, this is the only way to be consistent with the principles. If I got to put my principles first, I have to be at this point. And so that's how I uh, went from, you know, uh, being technically a statist all the way to being a uh, libertarian voluntarist. Yeah, it is. It is very consistent, isn't it? It's uh, the non-aggression principle. It's it's no one may initiate force under any circumstances against another person's uh, property or person. And uh, I mean, that's so consistent. It's it's everybody. It's universal. It's all people. And and there's no exceptions. Not if you wear a badge. Not if you have a funny hat on your head. Not if uh, during the hours of nine to five while the government's open. Uh, none of that stuff applies to the non-aggression principle. There are no exceptions. Uh, to it. And, and so that beauty of, of consistency really appealed to me as well. It's very interesting, too, that you mentioned there was a, a single kind of event uh, or catalyst, if you will, that uh, you kind of looked into and said, hey, wait a minute, I don't really like uh, the way that the U.S. acted in this circumstance. What are some other things that um, might not be the case that I particularly like? Uh, the Federal Reserve was the calling point for me. Um, the, the idea that they can just print money and uh, ruin people's savings by uh, increasing the supply of money at whim. Um, when I started to realize how that system actually works, uh, I started to realize that they're capable of all sorts of other uh, means of theft and stealing from people. And that led me to go and, and research a lot of this stuff, and I, I came to many of the same conclusions that you are now talking about. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree with you there. I, I knew a bit about the Federal Reserve even before then, and that was always something to me, an issue in the background that um, really hits at home, the concept of currency control and taking away the ability for people to choose what is most effective. I think that's a really big power grab, um, and any sort of forced monopoly is a big power grab um, that really ha serves no purpose um, other than to make those who are controlling it very wealthy. <laughs> right, and that's kind of the point, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Jamie, tell me a little bit more about, um, I guess, uh, where you see the comic book going, and uh, do, you, do you see any end in sight? Do you think you'll have another project that you'll work on, or do you, are you just going to develop this for a while? Yeah, I'm, I'm putting my full outside efforts of interest into the comic series right now, working on an issue um, with them versing the TSA, so especially in time for the holidays with people traveling a lot. But I just want to keep uh, running with it as much as I can, and I'm going to always be feeding toward it with the goal eventually of having um, the universe fleshed out in a, in a graphic novel. So I'd like to get to a graphic novel form with the origin story, um, and so that that's a, a long-term goal, as well as get it into an animated format. So I'd love to get, um, you know, an animated short just to, pr to present to people to see how they like it and then keep it going. I mean, literally, I want to grow this as big as I can. I'm you know, shooting for the stars, as you know, the stars in this case would be like Marvel or DC level. Will it ever get there? Probably, probably not, at least the United States, you know, soon. But I believe it has the opportunity to actually start to... Um, seed in in terms of uh, people's interest, because there's so many people now who are turning to liberty and are just so tired of um, all of the same old plots that are coming out from CIA-run Hollywood, whether it's movies or comics or TV shows, it's all the same thing. It's always worship the people wearing badges, which is going to be, you know, FBI, CIA, DEA, NYPD, Chicago's PD, Boston PD. You name it, every freaking show, every freaking movie is about 
loving on some form of government worker with a gun. And people are getting tired of it, and they're getting tired of the same old hackneyed plot lines. You know, there's only so many different ways you can do up a dramatic piece about, you know, police hunting down a criminal or, you know, some sort of uh, international government agency hunting down a criminal. People want something new and fresh, and this is new and fresh on every single level. On every single level, we have the artwork as being something that's novel as far as the characters go, as far as the uh, philosophy behind the series, it's novel. Nobody else is doing this. And I think that people are starting to just be hungry for it. They want something that actually pushes their mind. And, and the comic world has been like that, too. They haven't been pushing the philosophy behind the comics. They've been more focused on just changing little nuances and revamping their looks or revamping you know, some aspect about the character um, in order to spice it up. But people want something a little bit meatier than that. That's great. I'm, I'm really glad to hear about the direction that you guys are headed in. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the TSA, too. I actually just came back from a trip to Vancouver, Canada, and um, this was my first time actually flying out of the country. And I'll tell you what, the Canadian security people were just uh, very friendly and, and much nicer than all of the people that I encountered in the States and coming back into the States. Uh, they, they, I took my shoes off expecting that that would be, you know, what I had to do nowadays for everywhere. And they were like, no, put your shoes back on. What are you doing? That's weird. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. And that is not the case here in America. And so um, um, I, I wanted to touch a little bit on what you said at the beginning of the talk about uh, martial law. Do you see that kind of unfolding here in the States? It seems to be like a kind of soft thing where they're slowly turning up the heat on martial law, just implementing little things here and there, stop and frisk and the TSA and like all of these things, just little by little incremental, getting people used to obeying their, their state masters. Yeah, I, I mean, they're definitely doing little test runs with it. Uh, there's tons of little test runs that are being done. Um, you know, whether it's using National Guard, you know, we just looked at the, the recent issue over in Ferguson. They brought in the National Guard. Pretty scary. That's a standing army. Um, you look at anything after the hurricane, I'm sorry, the major hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina and so forth, you know, they're bringing in DHS, federal agents, Department of Homeland Security. They're, they're effectively militarizing police, as the government did and the Pentagon did, um, and they're giving uh, the, the the National Guard military wide powers to come in and start operating exercises. And they also did this with the TSA. I actually wrote my graduate thesis on dismantling the TSA and the philosophy behind the TSA. And, and they have been uh, doing operations outside of airways for quite a while now, uh, ports, uh, train stations, and things like that. So the government's been intentionally trying to push the envelope and put more and more militarization at different points and just seeing how people react. But I think it's just a matter of time um, that, you know, they start to do this slow creep, and eventually you get the right kind of catastrophe, they'll be able to full-on implement it. Now, that doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be implemented in terms of a system. I think, it's, I think the slow creep method is more likely, but it is reaching a point now where people are still being shocked by it. There, you know, there's enough of a change that people are starting to notice and it's become mainstream in the news to say, well, what's happened with the militarization police? How did, you know, how did they get this equipment? And the reports from the Pentagon giving them the, the surplus and the reports of the police departments buying helicopters and all this other type of stuff that's, you know, used for military purposes. Um, and and, and it's, it's just reaching a point, I think, now that, uh, you know, there's likely some background issue that the government's waiting to launch it for. I'm not sure what that is. You know, could be economic. Um, if you look at, you know, the global issues with the global bailouts from 0809, that's still an issue that hasn't been economically resolved. You look at the government when they try to do a different type of epidemic with, uh, you know, a different type of flu virus or something like that, or Ebola or whatever it is they're trying to say. The government's always trying to seed out some sort of high red alert for some issue, and I think they're waiting for something to stick. They're waiting for something that's going to really you know, give them the oomph that they need that people will be on board for. Kind of like how 9-11, everybody was ready to sell themselves, you know, the devil effectively to, uh, to protect America after that. The government's looking for something like that to, uh, to push the next, the next level up. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, Rahm Emanuel 
uh, spoke very keenly on this and said, you know, you never let a good crisis go to waste when you're the government uh, because people uh, in the government benefit immensely from crises. Uh, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, as you mentioned, all of these things that uh, cause a lot of chaos, that cause people to rally behind the state, they are immensely beneficial to politicians because then they can implement whatever laws and rules and all of these things and, and tax more people. And so uh, the government doesn't actually want to get rid of crime. The government doesn't actually want to get rid of terrorism because uh, then its whole idea behind what it does is to al allegedly protect people. Uh, that's blown wide open. Th that's no longer the case if there's no crime, if there's no terrorism. So they kind of actually want to foment that because it solidifies their ability to continue on doing what it is that they're doing. Sure, and, and, and even just in the market side alone, there's no market incentives for them to um, <laughs> to improve the the criminal condition. You know, if you look at the prison industrial complex and all the kickbacks and the fraud that's gone on with that, all the cronyism that's gone on has been insane. The military industrial complex and the money that goes into wars. I mean, there's so much cronyism behind the lines because of the the lobbying uh, by these companies that are basically you know doing revolving door politics. Um, there, there isn't a market incentive for the government to actually effectively reduce crime at, at the uh, inception, or or to you know reduce crime in a way that's actually long-term effective. The only thing they're good at doing is is finding ways to get more money for their campaign. Right, and, and quite frankly, the incentive is exactly the opposite of reducing crime because, again, they get more money. They get the taxes. They get to bully people around. They get to break into people's houses at 2 a.m. and drag them out to cages and all of this stuff. Like They, they love doing that stuff, and uh, they benefit immensely from there being the perception that there's crime out there and, in fact, making new crimes. Uh, you just pass a law, and then all of a sudden there's hundreds of thousands of new criminals, new lawbreakers. And uh, so it's, it's kind of like a self-licking ice cream cone where they just continue to ramp up their actions uh, against these kind of not existent threats, but they have to create the threats in order to continue on doing what they're doing. Sure. And, and the real threats that there are, and of course there are real threats that are out there, uh, terroristic threats, um, but nobody's actually sitting back and saying, oh, how did those originate? How did that come to be? How did people in the Middle East come to hate Americans so much? Because obviously it's not for our freedom. Um, and then you have to look back and see how many different CIA block operations were going on, how many different secret wars were being held. And then you look at the background politics and you realize, oh, yeah, the world hates us because the United States has been violating the non-aggression principle and going out there and meddling in other people's countries and killing people secretly and blowing up, you know, children and, and schools and weddings and you name it. You know, if you do the research, it's, it's out there as far as the reports because it doesn't get, you know, mentioned in the U.S. mainstream news whenever, you know, a, a drone accidentally bombs a wedding party in Pakistan. So, you know, the people have to look back in time to see what's really going on. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, Jamie, it's been wonderful having you on the show. We're just about out of time. Uh, maybe you can plug your website in the small amount of time we have left. Absolutely. If anybody wants to follow along with the comic series, uh, volcomic.com, B-O-L-C-O-M-I-C.com, volcomic.com is where we just post up the latest news and updates in the comic series whenever we're producing a new issue. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was really a pleasure to talk to you today. And uh, I hope that we can have you again on some time to talk about the developments in your comic. And I hope everyone has a great week. Take care. Thank you so much. <laughs>